Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. He manages $176.2 billion in state pension funds, a record high. He audits the spending of all state agencies and local governments. He reviews the New York State and New York City budgets. He must approve all state contracts. He's up for re-election this year. And he's the nicest guy in Albany. Or not. He's Thomas DiNapoli, the controller of the state of New York, and he's here to talk about his real personality. He's also here to talk about the New York State Pension Fund, the New York City budget, official corruption, campaign finance, and whatever else he wants to talk about. Mr. DiNapoli was named controller in February 2007 and was elected to the position in November 2010 and is running for it again this year. Previously, he had served in the Assembly for 20 years, representing the 16th Assembly District in northwestern Nassau County. Welcome back, Mr. Controller. Doug, great, great to be back with Oh, you. man. One of my absolute favorite guests. I mean, okay. Love doing your show. Okay. Mutual okay. Field. okay. Okay. Let's talk about this nicest guy in Albany routine. So there you are at the Le Legislative Conference Association Correspondence, Roast, uh, Correspondence Correspond. Association whatever it is, roast, I guess, and you do one of the great rebuttals of all times. I've talked to reporters. They loved it. You got a standing O, didn't you? Um, I got a great response to it. I know that. Oh, man, you and know. you did another routine. You did a shuffle? Well, we did a, we did a, we did a song after the video, and this is, this is a tradition that goes back over 100 years, and it's the, the uh, reporters that cover Albany. They put on a, a performance. And it raises money, though, for, for a good cause, for a charity. Right. And it goes, uh, this year it went to the food bank that serves the capital region. So it's all a good fight. It's kind of like, it's, it's Albany's version of the inner New circle. circle, right. It's a similar concept. Right, and, and, and the elected officials do a rebuttal. And, uh, they, ask, they ask a Republican and a Democrat to do a rebuttal, and they ask the governor uh, to do a rebuttal. So I, I got a task with doing the Democratic rebuttal. So you have you, have you, you have Rob Astorino, the Republican right. candidate for governor, and you have... Governor Cuomo. Right. Now, I've seen all three of them. Yours is a hoot. I watched it three times. Oh, tears, choked laughing. We're going to do a little bit of it now. We had fun doing ours, and it, it, we were into the spirit of the evening. Let's put it okay, that way. Okay, so we're <laughs> going we're, we're to we're watch two, two bits, and then we're going to talk about how the controller of the state of New York has all this fun on my dime. <laughs> okay, let's watch. You know, Don DiNapoli is the nicest guy I have ever known in my life. Can anybody in Albany really be that nice? Look, I, I don't know who's watching this, uh, but I need your help. Uh, I came to work here in Albany for uh, Comptroller Tom DiNapoli. Everybody told me what a great guy he is. Uh, he's not, not at all. In fact, take a look at some of the secret video I took uh, when they weren't paying attention. Take a look at this. Hey, Tom DiNapoli, how you doing, hey, man? Hey, call McCall. Tell me, how's the second best appointed controller in the history of the state of New York? How you doing? Oh, great. Second best? Well, second you know. best? Well, let me ask you this, okay. Mr. McCall. How's the second best candidate for governor in 2002 doing? What's that all about, man? Come on. Call McCall, go. Yourself. Up your f car, McCall. What? What's wrong with that guy? Man, this Tom DiNapoli? Wow. No, it's Ravitch. Hello, Ravitch. My God, Tom DiNapoli. Tom DiNapoli, how are you? I'm pretty good, Ravitch. And how are you? What have you I'm got in your great. hands there? My book. Did you read it? Your book? Am I in your book? Hell no. <laughs> What's it about then? It's about problems of local government finance, but I forgot you're not interested in that. Oh, sorry. Boring. Not interested. Not interested. 
So long, Rabbit! Hey, boss, what's wrong? Uh, don't hey, boss, me. What did I tell you about shooting your f***ing mouth off to the press? You're getting on my last nerve. I'm sorry, boss. Well, ju just don't let it happen again. And the next time you open your mouth to the press, use the talking points I leave you. Here's what you're supposed to say about Tier 6. Here's what you're supposed to say about contract negotiations. Here's what you're supposed to say about the state budget. And here's my lunch order for today. And please get it right. No anchovies. If I see anchovies on it again, we're going to have problems. Sorry, boss. Just get it right, Daniel. What a f***ing moron. You see? You see what I mean? I'm telling you, Denapoli, Denapoli's mean. He, he, he's unstable, I'm telling you. People need to know. People need to know that he, he, he'd do anything to get his hands on this video. I, I think he's actually got people looking for me. He really does. If anyone's out there watching this, please help. Hey, Daryl, it's Tommy. Oh, no! Who did the script for this? And how did you get the actors? I mean, the Richard Ravitch one, the Seinfeld takeoff, <laughs> is just the screen. But there, wow. there's lots of good ones. I would urge people to go to YouTube and watch this because yeah. the Stephanie Minor routine, the routine with kids, we're missing all that stuff. Talk a little bit about the background of all of this. How did you well, do we, all of this? Well, someone uh, came up with the notion that um, since I have this image of being a nice guy and, you know, all that stuff. that Which um, is obviously I true. guess it's true, but, you know, but um, we said, you know what, let's do a counterpoint to that. And uh, there have been other skits that have done similar things with other shows. And, and so we worked internally on, on the script and uh, we improvised the whittling. You know, you mentioned uh, the, the piece with former Lieutenant Governor Dick Ravitch. We, we knew we wanted to do something about his book, but last minute someone said, why don't you treat Ravitch like he's Newman on Seinfeld? And Dick is such a good sport. Right. He was willing to let right. us well, do I that. Well, they were all good sports. They Stephanie were all good Miner's sports. there polishing the picture and wiping the picture, cleaning the uh, frame for Governor Cuomo. And again, a last minute imp 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 improv that happened. And that was Karen so. DeWitt. De Karen DeWitt. Karen DeWitt, from DeWitt public radio. knocking the paper. I yep, know, yep. I'm, I'm ruining it. I don't, I, I don't want to spoil it. Okay, let's, let's to move on to more serious sure. matters. Sure. Pension fund performance. Yeah. 176.2 billion, record high, 13.2% yeah. return during this fiscal year. Yeah. How did you do it? Yeah. Well, look, the markets have been up. We benefit from that because we still have a big part of our, of our allocation that's tied to the, to the public equity markets. Sure. You know, the, the, the big name stocks that we're all familiar with. We're also well diversified. We did very well in um, uh, real estate and private equity. So, yeah. So that's, you know, we try to have that balance. We, we have limitations under law as to where we could put the money, but we are trying to, within those limitations, have more in the alternative so that when the markets go down, as we know they will at some point, we're not totally just exposed to the, to the public equity market. But the, I think the main point, Doug, is what we said from the beginning of when we hit the, the, the Wall Street collapse in 08 and 09, that that was not going to be a permanent situation. Sure that we were going to be able to make money back. So keep in mind, you mentioned 176 billion. We're proud of that historic high. Before the markets melted, we were about 150 billion. Yeah, and we billion. can show it on, on the graph that yeah. you, you produced. And then we went the down as low as 108.5. Right. So the fact that we've paid out well over 9 billion in benefits last year alone, we've been paying benefits out every year, and, and yet we're way beyond where we were when the markets tank. I think it shows the resilience and the strength of the fund. It, it certainly is a strong counterpoint to those that say public pension plans are not sustainable, because in fact I think they are. We're making our benefit payments, we're making money. Our goal is, and we won't know this till around Labor Day, hopefully we'll be able to reduce the contribution rate that we charge to government employers, taxpayers. So we had a slight reduction last year, we're hoping to have another reduction this year. So if we could keep that downward slope, it relieves the pressure on local budgets, and again, it will get more to a uh, what might be considered a normal range as far as what the contribution rates would yeah, be. Yeah, okay, Let, let's talk about long, long, mid and long range. Yeah, you're paying out. Do, is our revenue from the pension funds paying 100% of the out, output, or is there some no. general revenue? Oh, sure. General well, revenue you there look over well. the past 20 years, about 80% of what we pay out is generated by investment returns. Okay. 
So you also have employee contributions, and then you have taxpayer contributions uh -huh. as well. One of the problems is that when, you, when we calculate the rates every year, one of the biggest drivers of whether the rates go up or down is your investment performance. So right. our long-term goal is a 7.5% rate of return, long-term. Some years you're going to make it, some years you're not. So when we have a year like this, 13%, we like that because then we're able to book sure, you know, a, sure, a significant sure. uh, uh, a benefit from that. So again, I, I think when you look you look out, you know, twenty years, uh, we we beat eight percent. You know, so most years we in fact have been able to beat the number, and and the reality is, I think that means for the long term, the New York plan, unlike many other states, as you know, Jersey, <laughs> excuse right, me, it's Illinois. Criminal. It's criminal. Well, in because New part of the issue was in the good years they didn't fund the the, the pensions. No. Actually. So you come up to a bad year like 08 and 09, you really get dead. Like we all got hit, yeah. and and they're still digging out from under their mistakes during the good years, let alone the problems of the bad. Right, and also, I mean, they they totally overestimate revenues. I mean, that's well, almost a classic. The other problem is they 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 use, uh, they, they 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 defer payments as a way to help with other budget needs. Sure. And this is one of the problems when you have. The pension funds it doesn't always happen this way, but when you have boards that are politically controlled, yeah. So if they're controlled by the governor and the legislature, and the governor and the legislature want money to be used for other purposes, right. That's a convenient way to to dip in. In New York, and it's 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 not unique, but it is it's certainly much less common. We have an elected controller as the sole fiduciary. What you could argue back and forth between boards and sole fiduciary. One of the pluses of that for New York has been the ability of the controller to say no. When you've had instances in the past where governors and or legislatures try to change the funding for the pensions as a way to help with their budget problems, it's been the control. And this goes back to Arthur Levitt and Carl sure. Cole, Ned Regan. It's been both bipartisan, been able to say, no, you can't do that. And I think that's one of the pluses and one of the reasons why we have a better funded pension plan. We, we're we're going to be at about 90% funded. Before the meltdown, we were about 107%. Uh, so we're now moving back up towards sure. that 100 you know, Illinois is like 45 percent. Unbelievable. You know, many, many state plans are, are below the 80 percent, which is considered adequately uh -huh. We've never been close to that. So our fund is strong. Good news for the retirees and their families, but it also means New York State's financial books look better because of that. Mm -hmm. We're able to get a better rating from the rating agencies because of that. We, we have 80 percent of our retirees continuing to live in New York. Right. That means they're spending their money here. It's recirculated back into the economy. So the defined benefit pension plan is not just good for the members. It really is good for everyone. But you mentioned one of the things that uh, when you were talking that just, you know, the light went off. All the, all the things that you argue that a controller can do makes you enemies of the governor, the legislature, et cetera. There's a tension that's yeah. always there. But that's how it's set up. Be. It's meant to be. It's meant, it's, to, it's be. meant to be. Okay. That's how you promote accountability. And I just want to say, is before we leave the pension issue, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be sensitive to the fact that there are many people who are, do not have defined benefit pension right. plans anymore in the private sector. And I do think, and there are meetings and discussions going on, there needs to be that larger conversation. What can we do to provide retirement security right. for those who don't have? Because you know what? If they don't have retirement security, they come back to government anyway and taxpayer money. So, sure. so let's protect the good defined benefit plans that we have, like New York's plan, like New York City's plan. Let's let's see what we can do to help those that don't have those kind of benefits. Okay, let's let's move to the city. You folks did your you know your review of the financial plan and the budget, and one of the things that 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 was uh, uh, salient in, in your analysis is the UFT budget and what that UFT budget contract. means. Uh, uh, contract, contract, contract yep. rather, and what that means. Talk about the the impact of the UFT budget and what it signals for the New York City budget and its fiscal health and what are, what are the obstacles here? Well, the, the UFT contract is significant for several reasons. First of all, it's the largest group of, of employees for the city. So having some certainty as to what the labor costs are going to be is important. You had something like 150 labor contracts that the prior administration left, expired, right. not negotiated. Right. So, while it was all well and good to say, you know, the, the city's budget was in balance, we had identified going back over a long period of time, the big uncertainty is what's going to happen with the labor contracts. Right. So you have in New York City typically what they call pattern bargaining right. where Go ahead. You know, a contract will set the precedent for, for others. So, you know, there are ongoing negotiations with, with, with other municipal unions. One of the key aspects of the UFT contract is 
this notion of the union working with the city to save money on health care. Talk about that well, because it's, this it's, is this it's is a big, big expense area. That keeps a big growing. expense yeah. and, and yeah. growing. Yeah. It's also somewhat problematic about how you're going to get this three point well, four billion dollars. It's true, and 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 the, the municipal labor council is going to be involved with working with the city. And if there are disagreements on on how savings are going to be realized, there's an arbitration process set up. So, so there is still some question as to as to how to what extent they're going to achieve mm -hmm. that goal and how quickly they can. But at least there's a process in place to, to say there's going to be a joint effort, a partnership between the city and the unions to say how we're going to rein in these health care costs. Health care, unlike pensions, which are pre-funded, right. you, know, you, right. you could argue how much it's costing, but the positive is we're pre-funding that, that, that obligation. With health care, uh, you don't pre-fund, you do basically pay as you go. Right. The city had set up a... A, uh, a trust fund for retiree health benefits, but they, you know, that fund has been dipped into. During it's been used business. as a rainy day. Fund. But but now this mayor is, is starting to build it yep, up again, yep, so yep, that's yep. good news. So so while you're right, I mean, we still need to see how it's going to work. There is a commitment, in fact, to reduce the cost here, and what we saw very much as a positive is now, now that you've got this big contract settled, you at least know what the numbers are. So you know, we see 2014 to be in balance, 2015 to be in balance. You start to see some gaps beyond that budget gaps. They're, they're, they're not beyond the realm of what we've had in prior you years. So they're, they're manageable. manageable. Manageable, manageable. So when you have enough lead time and you know what your costs are going to be, then you can anticipate how you're going to be sure that you can close those gaps. And, and, and Mayor de Blasio and the council have plenty of time to do that. Look, the big challenge always is what happens with the economy. Right. If the economy suddenly tanks again, we're not anticipating that, nor do we want that, then, you know, city, state, all kinds of budgets could be uh, thrown out of kilter. But... In fact, the city is seeing increased revenue. Uh, while Wall Street is making money again, they, they're not hiring as many people as they used to have, but retail, hospitality, tourism, I mean, these are and big And also areas. tech, you pointed tech, that out. Tech, absolutely, there's a growing study. tech center, and we're pleased we've had some pension fund investments in that area, it helps us as well. So, so you're, you're seeing what, what in the past had been financial services, creating sure. all that. So now you're seeing a diversification of the city's economy that's helping to grow jobs in other areas. The problem is, you know, when you look at retail, hospitality, very often those new jobs are at a lower end of the wage sure, scale, sure. which is why something like the tech center, especially high tech, having that take hold, yep. not only in Manhattan, but in Brooklyn and Queens, those also are better compensated sure, jobs. Sure. So you want that mix of, of not only number of jobs, so headcount stays up in terms of employment, but you want those good paying jobs, more tax revenue. Okay, let's talk about your uh, anti-corruption activities. I mean, we've undergone a corruption eruption in New York, and you've been involved in both exposing it along with the, the Attorney General in terms of your task force yeah. and in other areas. Talk about your efforts, your anti-corruption efforts, Well, we, given we, the fact that it, every day you pick up a paper and some other yeah. member of the, our esteemed legislature and, and associated vendors, et cetera, are going to jail yeah. or being indicted. Yeah, or local officials across the state. Right. Yeah. Some of this comes out of our audit work, uh, and that's been an ongoing effort. What we decided uh, w when Eric Schneiderman became Attorney General, because what would happen is we would find something out, do an audit, and refer it to the Attorney General. Right. It takes a long period of time right. to get that all processed. The Attorney General and I said, you know what, let's have a joint task force. In effect, have our staffs work together as one unit from sure. the beginning so that when we get a tip or we see something in an audit, instead of waiting for months or sometimes longer to then get the Attorney General's office involved because they prosecute, right? right. So when we find something, we, we do a referral and we can confer criminal jurisdiction on the Attorney General. The Attorney General doesn't have criminal right. jurisdiction. Right. 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 So now we have this joint coordinated effort, a task force on public integrity. So we are more quickly and more efficiently by using our teams together, able to not only identify corruption, but bring people to, to task more quickly. Is the, is the level of corruption unprecedented? I mean, you served in the legislature. Is it, is it more corruption? Is it more exposure of corruption? Or is it just that the corrupt people are more stupid and getting caught? <laughs> it's probably a combination of all the above, but I think we're also in a time where there's less tolerance for it. I, I think as we've gone through this, you know, after effects of the Great Recession, money being so precious, taxes being of great concern, and when you see people enriching themselves, and that's largely what the corruption sure, comes down sure. to, it always come, it comes back to money in most right. cases. There's just zero tolerance for that. And, and so I'd like to think that not only our efforts, but local district attorneys, 
uh, certainly the the uh, the U.S. attorneys. I mean, you got to give credit to absolutely. To, to, oh yeah, to, to I mean the, Bahara yeah. and Lynch here yeah, in the city. Absolutely, They're the southern much and more, eastern district. Much oh, yeah. more aggressive on public corruption than than you've seen in a while, and we work with them as well. So you know whether it's as sometimes is the case, a member of the state legislature or the city council that was recently uh, a charge, or as we find across the state in some of these small communities, yeah, a treasurer, a clerk, you know, yeah, with, a couple of hundred grand here, a couple of hundred grand there, and right, writing there. out you know your personal bills on the on the on the fire district's oh, credit card. I, I, but you see, in some of these communities where where like everybody knows each other and nobody's looking over the shoulders, everybody's trusting each other. I mean, it's amazing how many uh, of those appointed officials get into that kind of trouble. Oof. And look, when you're talking about higher profile people like elected officials, like members of the legislature, it, it, it's very disconcerting because it, it reinforces the most negative image. I think it discourages people to want to run for office. We need more sure. people to want to. Sure. People say, well, how are we going to stop it? Well, you know what? We need more people going to want to run for state senate and assembly. Well, more it's not only the don't people who are running, it's the voters, too. I mean, the voters uh, are voting these folks in. Come on. I and mean, sometimes when you want people in charge, they get reelected. Right, excuse you know, me. No, so, okay. But we're going to maintain our vigilance. We're going to work with the AG, with the DAs, with the U.S. Attorney's Office. And for us, it gets back to the accountability for taxpayer money. Because okay. in, invariably, it's someone you know using money that's not theirs. There's been problems with member items and diverting it to friends sure. and family, and, and we're going to stay on top of it. Okay. The, I, I mean, there's so many things to talk about. Let's talk about campaign finance. This is, this is what I call the give me a break portion of our conversation. Let's, let's, let's turn to your video, how you describe this campaign finance law, and then let's talk about really a bizarre set of events that lead to one of the chief proponents of campaign finance opting out of a system. So let's go there. Thanks for your time, Mr. Majority Leader. I just have one last item of business. Would you please uh, pass this on to the speaker? Whoa! Is that a rattlesnake? Wow. Brilliant. Now I know how you got to be Majority Leader. You tell Shelly that's a little gift from me to thank him for that stitched together, back of the envelope, Frankenstein monster, public financing pilot project that applies to the controller's race in 2014. Tell us what you really <laughs> think about this well, campaign actually, that, finance. That's probably the one part of the video that really is <laughs> not, <laughs> that's not, that's not a joke. No, that's no, not a joke. No, no, we get that's it. Serious. We get it. We Look, get it. I, 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 I mean, this is, excuse me, editorializing. This is absurd that they do it at the last minute, yeah. they put in charge of the Board of Elections, which is totally dysfunctional, yeah. and you're not involved in any of the conversations yeah. to do this. Yeah. Talk about this. Yeah. Why? What happened and why? And is it personal? Well, I'd like to think it's not personal. So, so You'd like argue. to think. And, I, and I'll, I'll stay, you know, I'll stay the positive. I won't, okay. I won't be the wolf of 110 State Street. I'll be the positive. <laughs> okay. You know, you're sticking to the nice guy routine. Yeah, because you, you have routine. to, otherwise you, yeah, right. you, 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 you know, okay, you chip on your shoulders. It's not worth it then. It, it, you know, I've always said, we've talked about it on the show before, public financing is the only way. Yep. It may not be the best system, but it's the only way to say money's not going to have the influence, the connected are not going to be the only ones to run for office. But to do it, last but to change the rules three and a half years into the cycle where we've been playing by another set of rules would require me to return the money, basically most of the money that we had al already. It, the rules are rushed to be put in place. It's not even good for the challenger. The challenger's got to raise, you know, like $200,000 from 2,000 people in a short time, period of time. It's crazy. On top of it, it only applies to controls race. And guess who has to certify to release the money from unclaimed funds? The controller. There's like a built-in conflict. I mean, we're going to do it right. But you look at this and you say, it, it really was a last minute thrown together to be able to say we did something. And instead, the people who most have wanted have said, this, this thing. All the, all the advocacy groups in the and, civic and they, to opt out of the system. And they said, system. Tom, don't go into it. Yeah. So whether, whether I, I would have or should have or could have, once you had the people most advocating for it saying, if you go in, you validate a, a poorly crafted plan that is doomed to fail, and then people will say, see, it didn't work. So that's why I opted not to go in. But not to have you part of the conversation. Well, What's wrong with the four men in the room? Seriously. You've got Skelos, you've got Klein, you've got the governor, and you've got Shelly Silva. And then there's Tom DiNapoli, who's the person who's well, the, the pilot of this, you know, come you on. You know, the, the, the controllers office does not have a seat at the table. I mean, it's just, you know, we're not part of the legislature, we're not part of the executive, you know, so there's good of that. You would think that it's a matter of common courtesy? Well, of course, Come on. Of course, of course. Because I think, had they didn't do it the way we had set out in our legislation. Right. 
we, we had a we had an independent campaign finance board. We had lower threshold thresholds to to qualify for the money. But the most important thing, Doug, is that it would have been or, already would have been in place when New York City moved to this. It had a significant lead time, so you could issue opinions. Let me, right. This Forget about crazy. changing the rules in the middle of the yeah. game. This is changing the rules at the end of the game. It, it, it really was very poorly conceived. What we need to have is. It should not be an excuse to not do comprehensive campaign finance reform, public financing for governor, controller, attorney general, state legislature, phase it in. 2018. Maximize, the, I mean, I mean, maximize really. small donations. You could start with the legislature in 2016. Okay, we've got 30 seconds. You're running for office. Yep. What's the status of the election? You've got a primary? No primary so far. Petitions. General? Are, general. Uh, Republicans designated uh, the Onondaga County Controller to be my opponent. So there is a race, and we're going to work hard and get our message to the voters, and I hope to be back on your show next year to talk about what we're doing. Please. Okay, <laughs> quick. What's the bumper sticker for the campaign? Oh, my God. We're still working on the bumper sticker. Oh, we didn't have, we didn't have We didn't have a catchy one last time. So and the main point is Denapoli 2014. More than that, we don't, no, that's right. we don't that, need to that's get all, out. That's all, yeah. that's all you need. <laughs> what do you want? Real quick. Any news? Are you going to make news? What well, are you well, doing? We're putting out this week a report on prompt contracting, the state contracts with not-for-profits, and we're finding an even higher uh, poor performance, 87% of state contracts late for not-for-profits, which means they get late payments, they, get, they have trouble delivering their services. So this is an area where the state agencies need to do a better job. They're not, they're not adhering to state guidelines on prompt contracting with not-for-profits. Okay, we're going to have to end our conversation now. Yes, we will invite you back. Good. And hopefully, I mean, I, I, I probably, I, you, a Doug Museum endorsement is worth nothing, <laughs> but I would love to see you back Thank in, you, in, in November and December. Thank you. Thanks to Mr. Really Nice Guy, New York State Controller Tom DiNapoli. Join us next week here on CUNY TV. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.